Well, you're most welcome to this talk, and I'm particularly delighted to welcome Professor Norman Fenton. Norman, thank you for coming. Most welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me on. <laughs> so, uh, you're a mathematician, you're experienced in electrical engineering and computer science. Um, you're actually Professor of Risk Information Management, Queen Mary London University. Is that, is that right? Is that the correct title? Queen Mary University of London, I think, is yep. the correct attribution. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know universities get very particular about these, these kind of things. Yeah. Um, you're an expert yeah. in, in quantitative risk assessment and, and predicting the probabilities of unknown events. So, um, pretty interesting altogether. Now, one of the reasons that you, you've kindly agreed to come on is your recent uh, preprint, which is, is currently uh, being prepared as a full paper. Implications of the Office for National Statistics estimates of COVID-19 vaccine uptake in England on the representativeness of its sample. So there's issues here as regards how accurate the Office for National Statistics uh, sample is. But I actually wanted to go back a bit because I could do with a bit of a refresher and may maybe some people watching as well. Uh, the, the yeah. first thing I wanted to ask you, is it important to collect uh, quantitative data to learn about a population group? Because this is what we want to learn about the British people in this situation, don't we? Yeah, yeah, we do. I mean, if, we, if you want to make the strategic decisions that affect a population group, i.e. the kind of decisions that governments make every day, then we have to, you know, we have to have relevant and good quality data about that population. So, I mean, for example, if we believe there's a need to invest in additional public transport systems in a particular area of the country, say, then we need to have data that captures the true transport habits and needs of the population of that area. Now, as we generally don't know everything about everybody, we generally have to rely on sampling a subset of the population. And that's why getting a good, you know, getting good sampling data is so important and why sampling and learning from data is such big business now doing that accurately. And of course, there's been no notorious uh, cases in the past where people have missampled things and come to, to the wrong conclusion. So we, we need to assess accurately what the situation is so we can make reasonable decisions. And that was my next question. Why do we need representative samples of population to collect valid data from the population as a whole? Can you just sort of, yeah. sort of in, unpick that a little bit? What is a representative yeah. sample yeah. as opposed to the first dozen people you meet? Well, the thing is, yeah, the thing is, we can't generally sample the whole population. And that's the reason why it is so important to get a representative sample. It's because if we don't, well, inevitably introduce biases that can lead to flawed reasoning and poor decision making. So just imagine if we, let's say, own the supermarket chain and we had, let's say, a very large sample of people from whom we wanted to learn about, say, future meat eating, meat -eating habits. What well, if it turned out that the sample included only vegetarians, or was, let's say, very highly biased with vegetarians, you'd get a com you would completely misrepresent the majority of view of your customers. But on the other hand, let's suppose you've got, let's say, a massive sample, say 80% of the entire UK population, which would normally be considered, God, if you've got 80%, you must have, that must be really representative. But actually suppose that that 80% that 80 completely excluded all vegetarians, and you wanted to get, you were using it to, let's say, get, um, it, uh, get an understanding of the environmental issues of people, you know, what the environmental issues and views people had, then again, if you try to extrapolate that for the whole population, you'd again be introducing massive biases and, and that would impact your policy decisions. So mm -hmm. again, that's, it doesn't matter the size of the population. It's, it's about how representative it is in order to get that accuracy you need for truly informed and accurate decision making. And how would this normally be done in, in practical terms? So if I was commissioning you to do a piece of research, for example, can you give an example of how you would generate a representative sample of the population? Yes, yeah, so, so ideally the, the sample should be selected based on the features relevant to the questions you want to answer. So, for example, if you wanted to find out which party the country is likely to elect in a, in a forthcoming election, then for a start you should only sample people eligible to vote. And what's more, the demographics of the people in the sample, that would be, say, the proportion of people in each age group, 
socioeconomic class, ethnicity, etc., should be similar to the proportions of eligible voters in the country as a whole. Now, the thing is that polling organisations are supposed to do this routinely. And, of course, it's a higher-value business to do it accurately. And the ac- ultimately, the accuracy is assessed by how well they predicted, in that, for that example, you know, the result of the election. And I can see there's a lot of money and usefulness in this because if you can predict future buying habits or non-buying habits or whatever of a population, yeah. then there's clearly, clearly large commercial interests in that. Um, now, the, the, the sample... Oh, it's massive. Used, it's massive. Yeah, I, I, absolutely, yeah. Um, the sample used by the Office for National Statistics to generate their estimate of COVID vaccine uptake. How did the Office for National Statistics get their sample? And is it a skewed sample? Well, this is kind of like relevant to the, the example I gave of the 80, 80% of the country who are say, not vegetarians. It's a very large sample, but it is actually <coughs> a very biased sample. They use the set of people who were both registered as residents of England in the 2011 census and who, were, and, and who were also registered with the GP in England in 2019. So it's a large subset of the England population. It's not the rest of the UK, it's, it's, it's just England. But even as a subset, even as a sample of England, it has that bias because you had to have been in the, registered in that census and registered with a GP. Right, so there's two inclusion criteria there. I had to be in the 2011 census and and registered with the GP. Yeah. Both must and be must, correct. Yeah. So we've got a huge yeah. sample, but this could represent bias. So f- obviously, for example, people that arrived in the country since 2011 um, yeah. aren't going to be included, or, or people that can't get a GP for whatever reason, for example, if they're homeless or something, yeah. um, that they would not be in that sample. So is it fair to say that this, would we describe that as... Is a skewed sample the correct terminology here, Norman? Well, let's just think about it. So at the beginning of... If you, let's think about who's not in, in sample, as you say. I mean, at the beginning of 2021, in their sample, there were 39 million people. So that's 39 million people who met their inclusion criteria. But the population of England at that time was estimated to be around 56 million. Now, for a start, of course, it misses out all children under the age of 11 now, since they weren't born in 2011. (coughs) But as you say, in addition, all of those who failed or refused to be registered with the GP in 2019 are completely missing, as as are all the people who've come to live in England since 2011. So um, if we focus on those aged at least 18, I think there's around, that means there's around 8 million people missing, and it is a highly by a subset, as you say, there are, you know, people who don't register or refuse to register for, with, with a GP, you know, maybe may have conscious reasons for doing so. They may be health related. They may be, they're likely to maybe people who be people who are, who have a different view, for example, on vaccinations to people who are, who are registered with a GP. And of course, also the other problem is that, as you said, it excludes all people who came to the country, all immigrants, who came and residents who came since 2011, that's also going to be a much younger population. It's not going to be, it's not going to be representative age-wise of the population uh, 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 that are in the ONS sample. I must say, I'm actually, when I read your paper, I was actually quite taken aback by this. I've assumed basically all my life that the Office for National Statistics was the absolute bee's knees at this. I thought this was the sort of creme de la creme of, of, of research data gathering. It's the Office for National Statistics. And, and, and that yet they seem to have made well, what really is a pretty naive mistake. Well, it's, well, it's not. It, it depends what you're using this data for. Their data actually is very, is, is representative on lots of, lots of things. I mean, it's, it's okay, it's, it's maybe not representative exactly now <coughs> on things like ethnicity and age grounds. But, you know, in terms of, you know, where people live and uh, uh, lots of other things, it's it's a a big sample. It's it's useful in in a lot of ways. But in this, if you're going to use it to attempt, as they were doing in this case, to estimate the proportion of people who were unvaccinated, then that's where that's where there's clearly a problem. Yeah. And also there's an inconsistency. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, carry on. I say there's an inconsistency well, no, between I mean, other maybe, surveys. 
Yeah, so, so here's the, so the problem is, um, if we want to know what proportion of those 8 million who are excluded from the survey are unvaccinated, mm. then there's a massive problem, right? Because they're not, the fact they're not registered, they're under the radar, we haven't got any direct data on them. So we have to find, we have to look for other kind of like independent estimates of how many people in the whole population, rather than just the ONS sample, who are, who are unvaccinated. And there, there, are, there are other sources. The most obvious one is the UK Health Security Agency, mm. because they do actually provide an estimate of that proportion using the NIMS, the National Immunisation uh, Service database. And they were estimating that in May 2022, which was when the ONS were estimating only 8% of people aged under 18 mm. were unvaccinated. In fact, that claim now is down to um, is about 5%. So they claim in a very low number of unvaccinated in their database. But, but UKHSA with NIMS in May 2002 were estimating closer to 20% of those o uh, who were 18 and over who were unvaccinated. That's a very big difference. Now, they could both, of course, they could both well be correct, because that's the whole point. It's a, you're missing out. The ONS is missing out this very large number, these 8 million, who are highly un unrepresentative. So it turns out that what it did in that paper was use some fairly routine mathematics to estimate what the proportion of the unvaxxed in the 8 million missing was from the ONS data if the 20% estimate in the... UKHSA NIMS data was, was correct, 20%. It turns out that those missing from the ONS data, the proportion of those unvaccinated would be just under 70%, an enormous proportion. I mean, not, not the 8% claimed, you know, claimed by, for the population as a whole by the ONS. So you've got, a, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a real problem there. That's a, that's a, they may both be correct. Yeah. The problem is there are, there are other reasons, incidentally, not major, but, but, but small reasons also why there, there may be sort of inaccuracies in the, um, in the ONS data. Um, so, for example, um, we have actually documented evidence of people, and I can give references to this, of people who have been recorded as, as vaccinated, even with serial numbers and dates, when they were in fact never vaccinated. And we also know that there are several parts of the sort of recording process before the data reaches the ONS, where errors can occur. But set that aside, I, I, don't, I, I think that the ONS probably aren't too far away. When they say that, when they said in May 2020 that there were indeed only 8% of, of adults unvaccinated, in their survey, that could, well have been, that could well have been true. But whether that's true of the, as I say, of the whole population, when you add all the others, that's, that's clearly not supported by the by the UKHSA data and what we know about all the rest of that population and not in the ONS uh, sample. So I think we can conclude, the um, question is, does this mean the sample is not as representative as we would like? Yeah, it, it, see, the thing is, there is also one other key survey that took mm. place in May 2022. <coughs> it was, um, this was a very large representative survey of over 2,600 UK adults. And it was actually conducted by the reputable polling organisation, ICM. And it was used, interesting enough, it was used in the BBC top documentary called Unvaccinated, which was screened in July. And contrary to the 8% unvaccinated adults, which was claimed by the Office of National Statistics, and also by the BBC in that documentary, the actual proportion saying they were never vaccinated in that sample was actually 26%, even <laughs> higher again than the UKHSA estimate. Now, here's the thing. People might argue that 2,600 is not a big enough sample for an accurate estimate. But it turns out, if it's, a, if it's a reasonably representative sample of the population, then using standard statistical analyses, it would mean it would be more or less impossible for there to be less than 20% unvaccinated in the whole adult population. And interesting, if you look in detail at the ICM survey, it's all online, you can see all the raw data in there. You can see that actually it was very representative of the population estimates in terms of uh, age categories, socioeconomic classes, ethnicity factors, and also where people lived in the UK. The only thing, the only thing it was different on, as far as the ONS data, was this 
you know, 26% unvaccinated compared to 8%. So that does tell you that that maybe was a more representative sample. But, yes, I mean, if the... Um, yeah, so... Quite, quite a difference. I did check the, the latest UK health security agency is currently 17.5%, but of course that's now October um, 2022, yeah, yeah. and the ONS, as you say, is down to about about 5%. Um, if this sample... And, and not, incidentally, on those figures, yeah, no, on please, those figures, ahead. incidentally, doing the maths that's in the paper, on those figures, on those assumptions, if you do the maths that's in the paper, you'd still end up with about 70% of the people who are not in the ONS sample being unvaccinated, mm -hmm. the adults in, yeah. in there. So if this sample is not representative, how does this affect the validity of their data and hence their conclusions? Well, any conclusions that can be drawn from it, such as about take up of vaccination, attitudes to it, efficacy and safety, all of those analyses would only be true of the subset that were included. Now, as large as it is, we've seen that is not the whole population. So what, what it means is you cannot draw conclusions about it for the whole population. You can only draw conclusions about it for that very specific and biased subset of the population. So this, in essence, means that the Office of National Statistics is assuming that uh, people that are not vaccinated are actually being counted as people that are vaccinated. Is that sort of what it comes down to? What, what it means is that if you used the ONS estimate of the proportion of unvaccinated to, let's say, data on things like um, COVID cases, hospitalizations and uh, deaths from the population as a whole, because those are available in other, in other databases, mm. then you would indeed get an inaccurate estimate of the true uh, distribution of those uh, cases, hospitalizations and deaths based, uh, based on the vaccination status. You would basically be overestimating, for mm. example, the, let's say, the efficacy of vaccine mm. if you're underestimating the true proportion of those who are, who are unvaccinated. Think and of course, right what, what, what we want is... Yeah, what we want is accurate data so we can make really informed decisions. Yeah, we, we want to. We want to get this. Yeah, exactly. This, this if, is you've, not... if you've got if you've got data on the you know cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, which are from the whole population, mm. and if uh, mm. yeah, then then if you want to make inferences, of, of, you know, about the you know accuracy, for example, of the vaccine based on that, you need to have that that accurate estimate of the whole population who are mm -hmm. vaccinated and unvaccinated. Mm. Uh, can I ask you a, a completely unfair question, Norman? You might not um, be able to answer this spontaneously, but if there's, we always think that the UK is very good at collecting data, and on the whole, it is. But, but yeah. we've, we've identified this really yeah. quite glaring uh, omission. Um, how do we compare? Mm. Do you think with, with other European countries, with the United States, with Canada, with Australia? Actually, to be fair, the, the ONS, I, I believe, does a lot better job. Than, than mm. most other countries, from what I've seen, and we we have looked. So, at, for example, we've done sort of fairly deep analyses of the uh, ONS. For example, this this these kind of like vaccine mortality surveillance reports that they do, and they at least do make attempts to quantify you know the number of cases and fatalities etc. by vaccination by the very different vaccination status, not just never vaccinated or vaccinated, but also mm. single dose, second dose, third dose, etc. They do attempt to classify those. Um, and they do do it now. They didn't originally, but it was actually only after our prompting they were doing it, they did it by age groups, right? So they're, they're even doing that now. It's by no means perfect. There are lots of problems. We've reported extensively on that. But actually, that's a lot better than almost, you know, I, I've not seen that level of detail in any of the other national publicly available databases. So for all its faults, and they are serious faults because it massively, it, it really does mean that you can't, um, as I say, uh, trust for the whole population any inferences that come from the ONS data. The, it, that that is still that that you know that, that they are still doing better than other countries. So a lot of the data that comes from quite a few other countries could even be less valid than the data that we're enjoying in the in the UK. 
Yeah, that there's it's it's very difficult to make the make uh, sensible inference, accurate mm-hmm. inferences from from lots mm-hmm. of other countries' data because they, you know, they simply don't record the you know, properly. In fact, they don't record at all in many cases the vaccination status. So they'll mm-hmm. say it, you know, it contradicts their whatever that they should, you know. Um, the sort of rules governing sort of mm. personal details that are able to be held on people and stuff like that. Mm. And without going into results, yeah. Norman, you, you actually get the, the, the raw data in spreadsheet form from the Office of National Statistics, do you? Yeah. Well, any, any, anyone can, actually, because mm. when they um, publish their, their, their summary reports, there's, there's always a link on their web page to the, to, to the databases. They're, they're not ideal. I mean, one thing that we not very keen on the moment that they're doing is they're moving towards these age standardized mortality rates rather than giving the detailed age categories so they'll give fairly coarse age categories like at the moment uh and to do our latest analysis um <coughs> of the most recent months there that you can only get age data on categories from sort of 18 to 39 and then 40 to 49 and um that's okay but you'd prefer to have it in sort of five-year groupings to avoid kind of that confounding of age because otherwise mm. you have to rely on their um this age standardized mortality metric for get for, for taking away all that age confounding and um we're not not really not really too pleased that that, that that's that it, that that also is a is a particularly accurate way of mm. of capturing you know the, the real differences in age you know in ages yeah you want data to be as, as finely gradated as possible really don't you then you can get a much more a yeah, and, and, that's, and we prefer we, we prefer that, and to be, and that's the whole thing. We want to make informed risk benefit decisions. You want mm, to make it, mm, and they'll mm. be different for different age groups. Mm. That's the whole point. So, for some age group risks outweigh the benefits, and the opposite in other age groups, right? If you put it all in a single age standardized metric, yeah, then you're only able to make a decision about the whole yeah. population, which is not what we should be doing. Well, one size fits all. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the antithesis of individualized. Yeah. Uh, medical care no. isn't it i mean i think the office of national statistics should be congratulated really on, on making this raw data available so that independent academics yes, such as yourself then, can do the analysis yeah and 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 then they also tend to be quite quite helpful that they, they've they provided additional data you know where we've asked for it they, they've responded um in an informed way to, to the you know the questions that we've asked so because you know, there were some ambiguities in data, and they've they've clarified those for us and enabled us to sort of improve the analyses that we do. Mm. No, I think it's brilliant. It independent, independent, essentially peer review of the national data. So, so, so the independent, if independent academics are coming to the same conclusion as the ONS, then that makes it more likely to be correct. If, if there's if there's conflicts or tensions between the two, then we need, clearly need to look at that and. and Things probably need to be refined. Yeah, that's where we know that there are issues in the data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's where we know yeah. there'll be issues that where the data isn't correct. Yeah, yeah. And I'm delighted there are yeah. highly quantitative people like you because I, uh, I would struggle with that. So it's, uh, it's great. It's great that you're doing that. Yeah. A- anything from the recent paper that you want want to uh, the full write up, Norman? That you think we should, uh, without going into results, the things that you think we should, uh, anything else we should know about. <laughs> Yes, it's it's because we're specifically looking at the um, the differences in in mortality between the vaccinated and and unvaccinated, mm. and what we're seeing, what we're finding is that errors in categorisation very much biased the results in 2021 on those, and as we're moving into the more recent months, we're seeing those errors of categorisation. Um, not so prominent, and, and, and as a result, we're seeing quite different different results in the comparison between the unvaccinated and the vaccinated. Without going mm. into mm-hmm. too much detail, we'll, we'll be publishing it hopefully this week. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Now, clear, clearly, we're not we're not saying that vaccines are increasing mortality. We are not saying that. If someone's been vaccinated or someone's not been vaccinated, every human being who is alive uh, any day ha- has a risk of death. So it's inevitable that people are are going yeah. to die, but it's also rather it's also useful to, yeah. to analyze that data. So we're not saying anything about the uh, validity or the uh, risk benefit analysis of vaccines. We're just pointing out that there's interesting things in this data that, uh, that I'm delighted you're going to yeah. carry on analyzing. 
Uh, Professor yeah. Fenton, that is excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, fascinating video, very useful for me personally, and I'm sure many people will find that interesting and, and indeed beneficial. Thank you so much for coming on. I hope so, and thanks for giving me the time to talk about yeah. it. Thank you, Norman. Thank you.